However the state wishes to present it, I'll be able to follow it, I would imagine. Wonderful. Okay, Judge. So regarding Mr. Bryan, um, with regard first to this parole board issue, 17101B actually says that it will apply only to first offenders, where technically Mr. Bryan is a first offender. He doesn't qualify under the first offender statute because anyone convicted of felony murder, you're not allowed to sentence them under the first offender statute. So we have that problem first. But the second problem is, is that it refers back to A. And subsection A of 17101 actually says, except in cases in which life imprisonment, life without parole, or the death penalty may be imposed, and then goes through. So B can't even apply to anything that imposes a life sentence. And that's how the state is reading this, because when you look at B, the judge in fixing the sentence as prescribed in subsection A of this code section, subsection A says except for life sentences. So therefore, none of this will ever apply to a felony murder conviction. And then, Looking at count nine, merging into count eight. I understand factually the issue that Mr. Goff has brought up on behalf of Mr. Bryan that two separate instances, one an attempt to confine him taking place on Burford was just a continuation of something that was going on and on and on and on. Ironically, that was not the argument that Mr. Goff made at trial during his closing argument. He actually started to posit that Mr. Bryan was actually leaving um, and wanting to go home and just happened to go in the wrong direction back down Holmes and that he wasn't actually trying to commit a false imprisonment on Holmes. He was just trying to go home. But regardless, what we have here is an intervening factor. Um, I didn't know Mr. Goff was going to make this argument, but I believe there's a case out there that involves aggravated assault and aggravated battery. And it involved a man who had cut the female victim's throat and then also cut her face. The aggravated battery was on the face, the aggravated assault was on the throat, but there was an intervening time frame. And so on the one hand, I do know that there are numerous cases out there where if you start shooting at somebody and then continue to shoot, it's all one aggravated assault, okay? There aren't separate aggravated assaults for each time you fire, unless there is an intervening actual time frame where you've shot, they've run away, you've chased them down, and now you're over on another street, like we have in this case, you've encountered them again, and now you start shooting again. Because there's two different locations, two different specific places and times, that allows the state to charge it. And the reason it allows the state to charge it is because what you're really trying to do is prevent the state from engaging in double jeopardy. You don't want the state to be able to go on January 3rd on Burford, no, on, well, I'll do our case. On February 23rd, 2020 on Burford, he attempted to falsely imprison him. Oh, not guilty. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and move it over to Holmes and we'll get a new indictment and we'll do it over there on that date. So you wanna keep the state from going ahead and doing two different things in two different bites of the apple. You wanna make sure there's no double jeopardy here. Well, in our case, we don't have double jeopardy here because we have two different separate instances and they're both in this indictment and they're both two separate time frames. Yes, very close in time, between four minutes. I know I'm kind of giving the court both the defense side and the state side, but to be candid with the court, there are cases out there, especially the gunshot cases, that say it's all one continuous action. The state's position in this indictment, and one of the reasons we specifically indicted it this way, is because Mr. Bryan's attempt at false imprisonment on Burford was specifically done with his pickup truck when he tried to run Mr. Arbery off the road and tried to attempt to falsely imprison him right there with his truck. He attempted four different aggravated assaults on him at that point in time to get him to stop there. He was unable to do it. That's why it's a criminal attempt. However, over on Holmes, after he went up and chased him up, and then we begin the video, and Mr. Arbery turns back, Mr. Bryan does continue to go up Holmes. He actually goes up Holmes. It's on video. He pulls into a driveway. He says, I'm going to go ahead and keep going. He does a three-point turn, and then he comes down Holmes. 
He encounters then Mr. Arbery coming around the corner, and that is where that actual false imprisonment absolutely takes place, right there on Holmes, where Mr. Arbery is ultimately falsely imprisoned and killed. So these are two separate, distinct incidences, and there is no chance of double jeopardy because both of these things are distinct. They took place at separate places and separate time frames within the incident. So we ask that count nine not merge into count eight for Mr. Bryan. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure because of the way we're doing this. I did want to point uh, to the court to another case with respect to this issue that's been drawn back to the merger issue that I raised, and that is the point is whether or not it's a continuing offense. Kidnapping is a continuing offense. So, for example, if someone is moved, an asportation occurs, all the places during that movement are one crime. And I'll cite to the court Hill versus the state, 279 Georgia App 666, a 2006 case that's cited in Brower versus the state, 298 Georgia App 699, a 2009 case. It says that the offense of kidnapping is complete when, in this instance, Brower sees the victims forced them to the back office in the, uh, in the case of the office staff, and when he taped up and moved the attorney from place to place in the office. So the movement is the, it, the question is, if kidnapping is not a continuing offense, then is false imprisonment, and I've done a search and I just don't have the answer to that. And, uh, yeah, let, we'll keep the state to its argument. I, I, Understanding that with, with the kidnapping, the issue here, I think, is slightly different. Uh, as I understand, what the state's arguing is the way that false imprisonment and the attempt was alleged in the indictment was that the f attempt occurred on Burford. There was an intervening interval. And then later, short period later, but later, there was a completed act on Holmes. Okay, that's the argument that I understand is being presented, and that's why I'm going to look at the merger part of it. Now, how that fits and whether or not it merges, I'm probably going to take a few more moments to think that through and how that works. But that's what I understand we're looking at as far as the legal issues. And I understand the kidnapping part of it. You have a kidnapping just because you move them within the office, we're not going to allege it. Flip side of that is, when I mean, you look at some other statutes like the, uh, I won't tip it windmills, but when you look at uh, police chases, I mean, you can be charged with obstruction five times in the same chase. So, I mean, uh, the issue may seem simple, but it's not. But this is the way I'm going to approach it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. And I believe the reason for the merger um, really comes down to the issue of double jeopardy, uh, because you have to put the defendant on notice, because you do not want there to be an opportunity for the state to come back with double jeopardy, which is why you want to get as specific as possible, and which is what we did in order to designate these two separate instances in time and in place. So that is the state's argument as far as count nine merging into count eight. And that is what I have for Mr. Goff. Now, your Honor, with regard to the legal argument that Ms. Hogue made on behalf of Greg McMichael, actually, um, Noel was then cited in the case of Jeremy Scott, who killed Dexter Holliday. It was a Fulton County case. I'm embarrassed to say it was my own. And in that case, we had to resentence Mr. Scott because what the court did was sentenced him on the felony murder conviction, but then actually when he was found guilty of possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, the court went and took the possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, merged it into the felony murder, then merged the felony murder into the felony murder for the armed robbery. And the court went and cited to Noel, and this is Scott versus the state, 302 Georgia 29, it's a 2017 case. The state notes that, based on Noel versus the state, the trial court erred in merging the felony murder convictions and then merging the predicate felonies into the remaining murder conviction. 
when the trial court sentenced Scott on count two, the felony murder based on aggravated assault, count three, felony murder based on possession of firearm by a convicted felon, was vacated by operation of law. Therefore, count six, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, then cannot merge into count three, which stands vacated. We therefore vacate the merger of count six into count three, meaning the possession of firearm by a convicted felon, into the felony murder that it's based on and remand for resentencing on count six. Now, factually, you are a convicted felon at the moment you're shooting that person. It happens at the exact same time. So I think that kind of goes towards that, well, if it's all happening at the same time, it needs to uh, merge together. And I will also direct the court to a case I affectionately call the El Camino case. Once again, unfortunately mine. Uh, this is DeMarcus Graves. It is Graves versus the state, 298, Georgia, 551. Once again, a 2016 case. And at that point in time, basically it said, while the evidence was sufficient to sustain Springs Graves' conviction, um, we find an error in sentencing. The trial court purported to merge two felony murder counts with the malice murder count. The trial court then purported to merge two independent felonies, criminal attempt to commit armed robbery and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon with the two murder counts. And basically what they said in Graves was, no, you can't merge the felony murders into murder. You have to vacate them by operation of law. And once they're vacated by operation of law, that's going to leave you with the possession of a firearm by a convicted felon and the criminal attempt to commit armed robbery. Therefore, the trial court is required to vacate that portion of its sentencing order purporting to merge the two independent felonies and impose proper sentences on those counts, which I then had to go ahead and do and resentence Mr. Graves to the murder car charge with those two particular felonies. So there are two cases right there that show that that is not the case because they murdered Mr. Graves while attempting to rob him of his drugs while he was sitting in his El Camino in the parking lot of an apartment complex while being convicted felons. All of that took place at the exact same time. So therefore, Noel does not stand and has been overruled basically by Scott and Graves. So with regard specifically now to Greg McMichael, the idea that there was no vigilanteism here because after they confronted people, after they took their guns to confront people, after they confronted those people with those guns, then they would call the police is somehow a neighborhood watch situation. As Officer Rash testified, they're supposed to be witnesses. That's what neighborhood watch is there for. They're supposed to be great witnesses. Officer Rash said he thought Greg McMichael would be the best witness, being a prior law enforcement officer, that he'd be able to come in and take the stand and say what he saw. That's what Neighborhood Watch is supposed to be, not somebody running after people in a residential neighborhood where there are women and children and people out walking on a regular basis. This was a Sunday afternoon. It's a miracle they didn't run into families taking a walk that day. And on a random day, when the GBI went out with the drone videos and were just going through the neighborhood, they captured numerous people out taking a walk. A family with children were there. So the next point, that Greg McMichael has shown no remorse or empathy because he's unable to. Well, Greg McMichael was a law enforcement officer. But what he did on May 5th of 2020 was release evidence in an ongoing investigation into himself and to his son. Greg McMichael's the one who released the video to the media. He went to Mr. Bryan and said, hey, give me your phone, I'm gonna take it to my lawyer, took it to his lawyer and had his lawyer release it publicly because he believed it was going to exonerate him. That's interference with administration of justice. Yes, we did not charge him with obstruction or anything like that. But the fact of the matter is, is this is someone who was in law enforcement for years and actually actively pursued evidence in a case against him to be released to the media because he believed that that video showed he and his son were not guilty of anything. That's two months afterwards. The state's position is he hasn't changed his mind. The state's position is he and his son still believe they didn't do anything wrong. And that is 
a lack of remorse or empathy. The idea that he did not intend the death of Ahmaud Arbery, once again, he's a law enforcement officer, got a gun, went running after somebody. The jury did find that he intended to commit false imprisonment, criminal attempt at false imprisonment, aggravated assault with that pickup truck, and aggravated assault with that shotgun. And we all know that felony murder has a foreseeability component to it. Ahmaud Arbery's death was foreseeable, and especially foreseeable to someone in law enforcement. The idea that they wanted to get to the bottom of what an unknown person was doing in some neighbor's house, a neighbor they didn't even know, goes back to our vigilantism. This whole idea that they were trying to help the neighborhood out has been an excuse from both Travis and Greg McMichael. Ms. Ho got up here and said, this wasn't advancing the progression of the crime. And I apologize for this once again, Your Honor, but stop or I'll blow your fucking head off. I think that really advances the progression of the crime. You're threatening to murder somebody. You're threatening to kill him if he does not stop. And referring back to the post records produced in the bond hearing, Greg, McMur Greg McMichael was so not paying attention to his job as a law enforcement officer that he was not post certified from January of 20, 2006 through 2014. He was an investigator in the district attorney's office and he let his post certification lapse from 2006 to 2014, eight years. I won't even go into what that could have meant to those cases that were prosecuted by the district attorney's office. He then lost the post certification again in 2018 and Jackie Johnson had to make an accommodation and change his designation at his job just so he could keep his job through retirement. This attitude of I'm special and I'm above the law and the law doesn't apply to me and I can take my gun and I can run after people and confront the homeless guy under the bridge and then call the police later about it, that's vigilantism and that is the main reason. The thoughtlessness, the remorselessness, the desire so to be special and protect himself and his family by taking evidence and releasing it publicly when he knows there's an ongoing investigation is the reason we are asking for life without the possibility of parole. And with regard then to Travis McMichael. There's a reason, Your Honor, you did not grant bond to Travis and Greg McMichael. Mr. Rubin went back to all of those things listed in the bond hearing. The state will also direct the court to things the state presented in the bond hearing, including his text messages with all of his offensive racial animus and language. The jury did find that he had an abandoned and malignant heart. That's exactly what the jury found. They were given that he intentionally went ahead and did this or the other level, abandoned and malignant heart. In addition, I will remind the court that there's an old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And it's great that they had such good intentions to protect the neighborhood. But the thoughtlessness, the lack of vision to know how this could go terribly, terribly wrong. And the fact of the matter is, Your Honor, it was a year and a half, February 23rd, 2020, November. 2021, Travis came in here and testified. The state asks that you take into consideration his demeanor, his attitude. He said, this was the worst day of my life. Well, how'd that work out for Ahmaud Arbery? Not once, not once did he show any empathy or ability to place himself in the position of Mr. Arbery on the stand. And yes, four minutes of conduct. Well, four minutes of conduct. Usain Bolt won eight gold medals. When he runs those races, they're less than two minutes long. But the reason he's able to do that, the reason he is able to win is because of 20 years of training that leads him to those two minutes. Those four minutes are a reflection and a result of an entire lifetime of Travis McMichael and his attitude, his demeanor, 
what he believes. He's entitled to go ahead and go do. The same applies to Greg McMichael. That four minutes of conduct wasn't just four minutes of conduct. It was a culmination of vigilantism, a we get to go ahead and play law enforcement even though we're not, and that we're gonna go out and confront people, and we're gonna take our guns to go do it without any real understanding or consideration of the consequences. At this time, for Travis McMichael, these are the reasons that we are asking for life without the possibility of parole. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, that being all uh, argument and evidence presented,